Hello and welcome to the Literature Life. This is part three of the nine lecture series on Ejaz Ahmed's essay, Indian Literature Notes Towards the Definition of a Category. In this part, Ahmed continues to highlight those characteristics of Indian literary works that are hastily overlooked by people who consider themselves literary critics. The focus is on the word literary. All right. So he condemns the strictly literary critical approach that considers all material aspects of a literary text to be unnecessary, undignified, unliterary external details. In simpler words, Ahmed criticizes Western approaches like new criticism, which lend too much importance to the literary characteristics of the text, which lend too much importance to the word on the paper, the verbal matter of a poem or a work. He attacks the tendency of new criticism to deliberately refuse attention to the material aspects of these works, which Marxist critics like Ahmed consider most significant, we should keep in mind, okay? Ahmed complains about the isolation of literary research from other related disciplines like theater, like history and anthropology. In this part especially, he directs his guns towards new criticism, and the literary training of researchers in new criticism, and he directs his guns towards print capitalism. He considers these two factors responsible for the current shallow and homogenizing literary critical research that is rampant in the English literature departments in India as well as abroad. And we should keep in mind that Ahmed was writing in the 1990s and he's talking about the literary departments, the literature departments of the 1990s. All right. Uh, the whole essay, we should consider that this is not the present situation of literature in India. It has grown. Some limitations remain, but he's mainly talking about the state of research in India in the 1990s. He's talking about the approach of the Western critics in the 1990s. So let's get on with the text now. In this part, Ahmed begins by citing two properties that confront these literary critics in the age of print capitalism. So here uh, come the two uh, terms he's going to criticize in this part, the literary critics and the age of print capitalism. I must mention at the outset that in this section, Ahmed wants to make a very important point. New criticism is not the right theoretical approach to analyze the works of Indian literature because new criticism assumes it presupposes the presence of a stable text. Any analysis done on the works of the Indian literary tradition when they are mass printed or analyzed through new criticism, any analysis that comes out after these two factors have impacted the work are not actually showing the true character of the works in India, the works in the Indian literary tradition. The works of the Indian literary tradition have these two properties. Number one, they are oral and performative in nature. And number two, the authorship, uh, the periodization, many other things about the works are not actually fixed. And therefore, these texts are not stable. So any theory that assumes a stable text and print capitalism that gives us an illusion that the mass printed copy in our hands is a stable text. These two factors shadow the true character of the texts that constitute the Indian literary tradition and therefore we need a different interdisciplinary approach to bridge the gap between the various disciplines that these two factors have created to overcome the boundaries that approaches like new criticism have created between what is literary and what is not. So this was in effect the summary of the whole section. I have given you an introduction of all the points that Ahmed makes in this entire section. Let us now take up the text and see how Ahmed makes these arguments. So Ahmed begins by recounting the two main problems he highlighted in the previous section. Number one, the linguistic layering. And number two, the generic unclassifiability. We covered these two aspects, these two points in the previous section in detail. 
These two features of the linguistic layering and generic unclassifiability, Ahmed believes, should be chastising enough for any critic who calls himself specifically literary critic and for a critic who tries to assume a theoretical category called Indian literature. And further in this section, he gives many more features of the Indian literary tradition that are challenging for anybody who assumes a stable category called Indian literature. Now, Ahmed takes the example of Mahabharata and Ramayana, the two texts that are considered to be constitutive, that are examples of works that constitute the Indian literary tradition. And he says that although he has taken two texts that are considered canonical in India, uh, the properties of being oral and performative and the property of an inability of fixing authorship. These two properties will also be present in other works that are coming from the popular classes, works that are not so canonical in nature, works that are coming out from the alternate classes, alternate sections of the, uh, the society in India. So what's the first feature? He says, the fact that in the case of the literary productions in India, what is literary is not just strictly literary. The literary critics who want to analyze only the literary matter will face a problem in the Indian scene because in India, what is literary is not strictly literary. For example, the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, the constitutive literary texts in India may also be considered religious texts, may also be implicated in anthropology, philosophy and ancient history. And this complicates their literary status further. In other words, there's no clear demarcation between the literary and the religious or the philosophical in India like there is in the West and hence no stable status of the text as literary. Also, texts that are considered to be constitutive of the Indian literary tradition have gone through centuries of sedimentation according to Ahmed. What is this sedimentation? It is a kind of layering that age after age, generation after generation, there has been a change in the way the language was used, in the characteristics of the language, in the nature of the language in which the text was written. Many languages came and impacted the language of the text. So, the linguistic layering that went on in the text changed its character from generation to generation. Secondly, each change in language says a lot about the change in the nature of the society. Each change in language may also be a sign of the changing ideologies of the time. All right, we know that language change is many a times a result of the changing ideologies of the society. Sometimes a change in language suggests a change in the power of the ruling class or the shifting of the power from one class to another. So these changes have already gone into the character of the text and has changed the original character of the text. So what we have with us has come to us after a lot of layering, after a lot of sedimentation and is not the stable original text that one author single-handedly created. Now, these were the two features that Ahmed casually mentions. The main factor that threatens the stability of these texts of Indian literature is that the nature of the works in the Indian literary tradition has mainly been oral and performative, meaning that print capitalism came only in the 19th century. Before that, before the beginning of the so-called modern age in the Indian literary scene, texts were passed on from generation to generation through the oral mode of transmission. And since the oral rendering, the theatrical rendering of a text is not fixed, it changed the essential character and the essential contents and the original contents of the text while passing from one age to another while passing from one society to another. And how do the contents of these texts, the original contents of these texts change from time to time? Because of these three or four features that Ahmed mentions. Number one, the durability of their imaginative reenactment. 
the original contents of the text are reenacted by every society by every generation according to their own imagination and since their imaginative reenactment is not always same that changes the nature of the text number 2 the always local and immediate construction of their meaning the construction of meaning is done by the audience and the performers according to their own context according to their own historical ideological backgrounds and thus the construction of meaning is not always similar in all society at all ages and thus uh, this threatens the stability and the original meaning or the original character of the text next the flexibility of their assimilation into felt life each society interprets the message in the text in their own way and they adopt and assimilate that message into their felt life in their own way so there's a change there and finally therefore their irretrievable mutability as written text once the texts are written the nature of being mutable the nature of being changeable the nature of being flexible that becomes irretrievable you can't now change the nature of these texts once they come under print capitalism or some sort of cinematic media like the ramayana and the mahabharata and these centrally produced versions through print capitalism or cinematic narration these try to stabilize the meaning these try to threaten these local immediate flexible mutable characteristics of the text in the indian literary tradition ahmed insists that before the arrival of print capitalism in india and before the centrally produced versions of texts like the mahabharata and the ramayana and the b r chopra uh, spawn, produced versions before this the essential nature of the texts in the indian literary tradition has been oral and performative and cannot be gauged by restrictive theories like new criticism now ahmed brings our attention to another aspect of these works that make them unsuitable for the specifically literary analysis that the english literature departments were conducting in the 1990s he says that in the case of indian literary tradition take the example of the bhakti poets you cannot fix the authorship even when a doha or another genre has it contains a signature line which carries the name of the poet despite its presence despite the presence of that line we know that the text itself since it's oral and performative in nature it has changed since many languages has impacted it it has changed since even there even when there's a signature line present we are not sure that the same author has originally and single handedly created that poem or the creation so there are problems in fixing the authorships when you can't fix the authorship you can't fix the periodization you can't fix the periodization you can't fix the social circumstances that were responsible for the creation of the text and hence a new critical reading will be restrictive and limited in its scope especially in the case of works from the indian literary tradition ahmed highlights that a critic who has been trained in modern approaches like new criticism such critics are restricted and limited in their capabilities what they can do they can only be sensitive to the verbal meaning of the text they can only access the word on the page they can only analyze those words and bring out the meaning and even when these critics try to consider the social background the biographical details of the poet and the author even then their focus is to find a central idea to establish the poem as a stable text this is the argument he makes and it's quite a valid argument because so many of us have strived so hard in our school and college days to find the central idea of the poem to fix the central meaning of the poem because we were also being trained in restricted approaches like new criticism we were also trained in what ahmed criticizes as the method of close reading and the method of close reading only avails 
a narrow engagement with the text is what ahmed says so ahmed asks what are we supposed to do when the text that we are to analyze are forever divided between word and performance what we see on the page has gone through sedimentations the authors are not fixed the locations are not fixed the periods are not fixed there's hardly anything stable about these texts what are we supposed to do when we are trained in new criticism but our, but our texts are hardly anything but stable in other words ahmed is again highlighting the unsuitability of the western approaches when it comes to the works of the indian literary tradition in the next paragraph ahmed brings our attention to even more complicated problems in assuming a stable theoretical category called indian literature in india along with the words that we analyze there's so much more to the aesthetic densities of the works and the circumstances of their creation ahmed says that the aesthetic densities of certain kinds of music dance gesture ritual on the local as well as the trans indic plane there's so much to explore about how these forms originated what were the social circumstances of their creation and their alteration and their subordination and their total abandonment so there's so much to know about the aesthetic densities of these forms along with the word on the page that we get and think is a stable text apart from that the anthropology of certain kinds of recitation and locution how a certain kind of recitation came into vogue how a certain kind of reading came into being in a social setup there's so much to know about that what is the social history of certain kinds of belief the beliefs that played a role in the creation of the texts there's a social history behind those kinds of belief and we hardly know anything about it the genealogies of temples mats communities pilgrimages we don't know anything about that uh, some locution some recitations were connected with some sort of uh, social histories they were connected to the genealogies of certain mats and temples and communities and pilgrimages certain music dance gesture is in turn connected with certain recitations certain recitations are in turn connected with the genealogies of temples and communities and pil pilgrimages all right we know so little about the materialities out of which certain images arise how certain expressions of grief and joy came into being and be became a form that we now know as a form that we now know as an elegy or a certain kind of song but how did they come to originate there's so little in the knowledge in the disciplinary knowledge of the specifically literary critic is what ahmed wants to say so ahmed declares that it is an error to think that by knowing the word on the page we know everything about the text there's so much that is in the background of which we feel the power but we don't know the social history the origin of these factors that play a very major part but we know so less about but ahmed insists that by saying these things he doesn't mean that a literary critic has to know the genealogies of the temples that he has to know everything about architecture anthropology history sociology and arts he doesn't mean that he says that will be nonsense if i asked you to know everything before you went out and started your research on something literary but he says that only literary critical abilities are not enough the kind of work that is required has to be done across disciplinary boundaries we have to stop being so uh, highly placed we have to stop creating and preserving this literary boundary which we consider so dignified and we have to work along with different departments and different disciplines that enrich our literary research these departments can be 
the departments of expressive arts like dance, music and theater. And they can be the departments of human sciences like anthropology, history and sociology. We have to work along with these disciplines and bring in our literary knowledge to have a fuller picture to make our research of value and to make our research worthwhile. In the next paragraph, Ahmed tries to explain why he considers print capitalism as the culprit. How he considers print capitalism has changed the site of production, literary production in India, and how it has changed the perception of the works that constitute the Indian literary tradition. Ahmed considers that before the modern age, before the arrival of the print capitalism, before the 19th century, the site of literary production in India was the alternate classes. Great works of literature were being produced by social classes that were marginalized. Great works of literature were coming out from people who were being exploited. For example, the Shudras, women, tribes, peasants. These were the classes whose life processes became the content, the matter for literary production in India. But with the arrival of the printing press, literary has come to mean something that is printed. And these classes whose life processes were the matter of literary production were essentially non-literate. When you focus on the printed form in a non-literate society, it takes away the privilege from the non-literate society to be literary. Now the literary can only be the, uh, the liter literate people who are educated and who had the leisure time to read and produce literature. Thus, the site of production of literature changed with the coming of print capitalism. So what was literary ended up being quite elite and quite away from these non-literate societies that were completely capable of producing and being the content of great literary work. And thus there became a gap between the real literature that was being produced in India and what the print capitalism encouraged to be literature. And in the 1990s, Ahmed says that if there is some progressive work that's going on in English literary departments and research and the work is interdisciplinary, it is interdisciplinary because the gap between the oral performative and the printed is created by print capitalism. And the progressive research in literature is now going towards bridging the gap, which wasn't there in the first place and was created by print capitalism. Similarly, what is literature and what is not literature? What is rural and what is urban? What is popular and what is elite? What is authorized and what is not authorized? These distinctions are the distinctions created by print capitalism and modern approaches like new criticism. And most progressive work in research in literary departments these days is focused on bridging these boundaries that these two factors have created. In the final paragraph of this section, Ahmed focuses on the nature of language use in India and he highlights that the case of India is different from the Western countries. In the Western countries, when they were being consolidated as nation states, that was exactly the same time when their literature was also being consolidated. And usually, a single language was the focus of attention. A single language was declared the national language and the literature was produced in that language. This is not the case in India. In India, there is a kind of unity in diversity. We are united in our civilizational uh, background. We are united in our cultural ethos. But in our language, we stand divided. But that division has not really been a problem. Even our nationalist movement has been multilingual. Even when there were riots between different classes or religions, the riots have also been multilingual. The question of language and the question of having the need of having one particular national language and having all the literature in it has never arised in India. Most movements in India there have been geographical boundaries 
and people have been united. There have been linguistic differences and people have been united. Most of our movements have been multilingual, but that hasn't stopped us from attaining our objectives. And this is precisely the reason why certain approaches that do well in the Western countries are not suitable for countries like India and certain areas in Asia and Africa where similar characteristics exist. So here we are at the end of this section. In this section, Ahmed has basically said that the works in Indian literature are oral and performative in nature. They are never completely literary. They are sometimes philosophical, religious and literary at the same time. And uh, sometimes the authorships are not fixed and therefore it's hard to fix the periodization of the works and therefore imagining a stable category called Indian literature, which print capitalism assumes, which approaches like new criticism assume that is not applicable to countries like India, to our literature, where such diversities exist, but with a unity in our structures of feeling. So I hope this section helped. Thank you so much for your time. Have a great day.